This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. I am your host, Kat Daniels, and today with me I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Darian Parker, who earned his PhD in sports education leadership with an emphasis in behavior modification from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He earned his master's and bachelor's degrees from James Madison University in kinesiology with concentrations in exercise leadership, athletic administration, and advanced coaching. Dr. Parker is also a certified personal trainer through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Association, and he has his own podcast called Dr. D's Social Network. Welcome, Dr. Darian Parker. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate you having me on your show. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming on today and and visiting with us. I have listened to your podcast and, of course, fell in love with it. And so I'm glad that you agreed to come on mine. (laughs) Thank you. I think it's a mutual admiration society for our podcast. Yeah, 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 absolutely. (laughs) So do you want to kind of start by telling us how you got into the, the sports industry initially? Yeah, I think for me, it just started when I was really young and my father really pushed me to do something I really love to do. And for me, exercise has been like a constant in my life. I I barely remember a time where I wasn't exercising. I used to go with my dad to the gym when I was a little kid and watch him work out or play basketball or whatever. And it just was apparent to me that this is what I wanted to do. On I didn't know what that was initially, but as I got older and got in athletics, eventually getting a scholarship to run track at uh, James Madison University, it just was a continuous part of my life. And so I just ended up studying kinesiology for my bachelor and master's degrees, and then uh, decided to go for my doctorate in sports education leadership for more of a psychology-based degree. And then it just kind of went into teaching, and I was a personal trainer from the beginning as well. And really just wrapped into that, rolled into just higher levels of exercise, you know, executive levels and running facilities, um, overseeing other facilities, things of that nature. And then now being working from home, creating a lifestyle where everything that I do is remote, have a live virtual personal training service I've been doing for several years. And then co-owning a spa fitness and recreation consulting and management company. So um, I really carved out a niche in the fitness industry over almost 20 years. And I think it just always comes back to like exercise. And I was doing that before this. I was uh, doing some intervals and sprints and I was like, oh, I got to come on this podcast. I got to stop this right now. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. That's um, a lot of physical activity for you then. That's, you know, yeah. quite quite different, I think, than is the norm these days. But completely <laughs> that works out for you, though, with your business model, basically, because you've been online for years. And so with coronavirus, it hasn't probably affected you a lot, right? Yeah, actually, my business, I, I've been very fortunate. My business got substantially larger yeah. during the time because for a lot of people, their gyms closed. Mm. And uh, even though a lot of the country's reopening things, uh, as you're probably seeing, there's large spike in cases again and yeah. uh, a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a it's a tenuous thing at this point, gyms and, and the virus. Um, you know, people are afraid to go to gyms or they don't like how the setup is. And so more and more people I'm getting calls from is like, these gyms are not opening anymore. They're shuttered permanently. I need a different way to work out. Um, I want to be safe, but I still want to get a good workout type of thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the world going forward is going to be incredibly different than I think what we're all used to. It's going to be a huge shift for everybody. So that's awesome that you were able to fortunately kind of get ahead of the curve there a little bit on accident. <laughs> Was I it know, on accident? I just, you know, well, you know, one of the things we always did in my company is we we do a trends report. And so every year it's like really looking at, hey, what are the trends in exercise and wellness? And for a lot of fitness is really growing at the same time that technology is, it's exploding. Both are pretty much in their infancy in terms of how long they've been around. In terms mm-hmm. of like personal training and stuff really hasn't been a prominent thing since the 90s, where it's more on a mass 
uh, deal. And mm -hmm. the internet really hasn't been a, a wide adoption until essentially the 90s as well, although it was created back, you know, in 1969-ish. It wasn't a wide adoption level until around the same time that fitness really took off. So we've kind of grown together. Mm -hmm. And I saw that this is going to be a large part of the fitness business in the future. So that's why I decided to get into it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's perfect. So how did you decide to go from owning your own business and doing so successfully and working out and all those things to podcasting? Podcasting to me, I never really was that into it. Like back in the day, I mean, it wasn't as big as it is now, but like, I just was, wasn't paying that much attention to it. And then I caught wind of a few podcasts that I was like, oh, maybe I should check these out. It sounds like there's some interesting things going on. And as I listened to the podcast, I was like, this is basically what I already do. I have six or seven phone calls a week with people uh, that I've met through LinkedIn over 13 years. And we're having these great conversations. And I said, this should be like, this should be a podcast. It's like, I'm going to have plenty of guests based off of the network I have. And I remember I was sitting in the kitchen and I told my wife, I'm like, I'm going to start a podcast. And she was like, I'm sure you will. You always do these things you say you're going to do, <laughs> you know, type of thing. <laughs> so I immediately out the gate had just lots of guests and lots of opportunities to chat with people. And uh, I just really love it. It's a great space to uh, learn. I think it's a good educational tool, especially. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. So do you guys, I mean, on your podcast, you kind of do the same thing similar to what I do, where you guys just talk about like life and, and things in general, mm. right? Yeah, there's no script. I just show up, the other person shows up. Often, I don't really know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, we may have had a conversation before, <clears throat> made like a discovery call, but I, I try to not let them tell me a lot about themselves. Yeah. Because I want to explore that on air and let the audience discover the same way that I'm discovering with it. Yeah. Which you and I are the same pretty much there. I don't do any research or anything like that beforehand. Um, I mean, other than I did a little bit with you by listening to your podcast, mm -hmm. but that's just because it was a podcast and I can't resist podcasts. So <laughs> do you find that this is the host in me? Sorry. Do you find that uh, people learn a lot about you through your podcast? I do. Um, and I actually enjoy kind of sharing part like pieces of me, I guess, in a way ab about myself, you know, with my listeners and things like that. I, I appreciate storytelling in general in any way, shape or form, whether it be in a book or in a podcast or, you know, in a movie, whatever the case may be. And so I really appreciate the story that comes along with not just the podcast itself, but also like the host of the podcast, you know, and things like that. Because there's things that you can pick up from listening religiously to things like that, that you wouldn't otherwise notice or, or even know about unless you listen to the whole story. Does that make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What about you? Perfect sense. I uh, always direct people to my podcast if they want to learn about me. Yeah. And somebody says, well, how can I learn more about you? Things of that nature. Uh, I go, well, I don't have a website for my podcast on purpose because I said, well, I have such a huge portfolio of podcasts. I just go, just listen to any of the podcasts and you'll start to learn about who I am mm -hmm. and what I think about things hmm. and this and that, because it's a long format of how, of me talking mm -hmm. versus me saying, if you look at this, you read an about me section, it's not going to encapsulate the feeling of what it means to know me. Mm -hmm. But if you hear me talking and you hear me laughing and you hear me be sad and you hear me be inquisitive, you'll start to learn a lot about my personality through the people I talk to on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting that you put it that way. I actually, one of the things that I like about your podcast is that it doesn't have an introduction, like a, a an no. introduction. <laughs> yeah. That's like the same every single time, you know, but I actually appreciate yeah. that um, because it just kind of, it automatically draws me into the whole story of what I'm about to listen to. And I love that. Well, thank you. And that's definitely on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could say I was like, oh, I stumbled into it. It's just, um, I did a lot of studying of podcasts too. Other thing is I'm a big kind of research study person. Mm -hmm. I, think I think it's it. from my doctor, my doctoral work, you know, right. and, uh, so I looked at all these stats about podcasts and I was listening to more and more. And I said, there seems to be a common theme of like kind of a show song mm -hmm. type of thing. And I was like, 
And I get asked all the time, people are like, oh, I can make you a song or this and that. And I'm like, I don't think so. I'm like, I, every episode feels different to me. Right. So how I, the music I use, how I intro it is always going to be different. I can't use the same thing for, for me personally. Right. So I don't want to get too like super in depth about podcasting just because I, mm-hmm. I want everybody to be able to listen to it. But <laughs> do, mm-hmm. do you edit your episode immediately after? Good question. <clears throat> yes, always, yeah. always, immediately after. And, uh, you know, I listen back to it and uh, just kind of get some feelings about it. When I listen back to it, that's when I had to figure out the title, that mm-hmm. I, the titles I use for it. Uh, I'll make notes during it. On here on Zencaster, the timeline footnote, I usually put in notes and go, oh, let me go back to that part type of thing. You know, gotcha. and, um, but yeah, I love to edit it right after. But sometimes it takes a little time just because, I got to find the right music. I have to feel like, what's the introduction I want to do? I don't have a script. Everything I say when the podcast comes on is just off the top of my head. You know, it's just like how I'm feeling about it, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I ask because I, um, I edit after, but that's also partially just because when I, when I first started podcasting, I just kind of dove into it because I knew that if I took too much time to do it, that I would talk myself out of it somehow, basically. Uh And so I was just like, I'm just going to do it and figure it out as I go. And so that's what I've been doing. But yeah, I have found that it's, it's much, it's just more beneficial to edit immediately after than it is to wait any amount of time to do it. So you went through your your master's degree and bachelor's degree, and then you got your PhD. And did you open up business pretty much immediately after that? Or or did you have like a, a lot of teachable moments along the way there? <laughs> no, I like that teachable moments. Yeah. Um, I, I did, had no confidence to be like a business owner when I finished my PhD. I didn't even think that was something that I wanted to do or think I thought I could do. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I was, you know, I grew up in the fitness industry in a time where basically, you know, you basically worked for a gym or, you know, or you maybe had your own business, but I didn't, I never heard of anybody who was like doing it in a way that I felt attractive. I felt like they were just killing themselves, working for themselves, constantly working all day long, mm-hmm. or they took on the debt of a brick and mortar, you know, paying rent to somebody to lease. And I just was like, I got to wait till the right time to see how I want to do this, where I could basically have a limited investment into something or a space and then could still have a very profitable uh, business, which is where it is now for me is because I'm in the virtual space. I don't, you know, a live virtual space. I don't have a facility. I have nothing that I have to worry about utilities or a lease you know, those things I have insurance, uh, which any trainer should have if they're, you know, working on their own own business. But beyond that, it's every, I don't have to buy almost anything. So everything is almost a pure cash flow for me on that, uh, with taxes being an exception, obviously. But, um, so I just really took the route of like, okay, let me find a good environment that I can be in and learn, you know, kind of put in the reps get a lot of experience training because a lot of training is just a lot of volume. You need to get the volume in over right. time, get used to working with people, do the job over and over again, develop your people skills, um, how you want to present yourself in the business. And so uh, really for me, what happens, I spent a lot of time training and then over years I became an executive and a facility operator. So that gave me the business sense of understanding if I want to get into a larger business of like running facilities, like overseeing that aspect, working with um, corporate clients, uh, hoteliers, people like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I mean, you're right about, you know, I, when I think of, of personal trainers or even people who work in that era, it's pretty much just like you work in a gym or you're a personal trainer um, who owns your own business. And then you own a gym basically (laughs) yeah yeah everybody wants to like have their own business or own gym Mm -hmm. i just never aspired to that like i always wanted to be i wanted to own something but i i I was very into the virtual space i honestly i saw it coming that's not me that's not hindsight or else if i had just started the business during the coronavirus and i said that it'd be like okay it's convenient to say that but like 
I felt like I saw it coming years ago. I said, this is where it's going to be mm-hmm. is limited monetary investment for me. And, um, and then starting a uh, spa fitness and recreation consulting and management company was more of like, I know how to run that business. Mm-hmm. I want to run it with somebody that I trust. And also we don't want to own a gym. We want to be able to run gyms and consult for other gyms, but not have to put up all this capital and everything to create this. Now, the other hand, what that also means is that the profit margin is not large in my other business. It's a lower profit margin, but also not trying to kill myself and work constantly. That's not my idea of a good life. I want to be comfortable, but not overwork myself in the sense that I got to grind constantly just to live a certain lifestyle. You know, I'm okay with having less. I don't need to have a ton, you know? Right. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I'm much more concerned about like a work-life balance than anything else, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's too much of um, sometimes our society, especially for me growing up, was this whole super accumulation of wealth, capitalism, and the sense like, I, I think capitalism is good, but in just sense of like, always trying to dominate business, always trying to accumulate wealth or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just think that uh, not everybody wants that. I know a lot of people think that that's what you should be striving for, but it's not in my playbook. You know, as I've gotten older, it just seems less important to me. And I'm willing to bet that I think a large portion of people are starting to turn that way at this point, because I've been around super wealthy people most of my uh, working career, Mm -hmm. it doesn't make you happier. It definitely doesn't make you happier. It doesn't make your life more fulfilling. It actually brings a lot of stress and a lot of problems too. Right. Yeah, it definitely does. People underestimate, I think, that part of it. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you may make life a little easier. I don't- In some areas. I'm not dumb about that. Yeah, you're made to do some things- you know, that other people can't do on some level. But in the end, there's really, honestly, it's not a huge advantage from what I've seen. And I have firsthand experience being in that environment. Mm -hmm. Again, that's most of our clientele. That's most of my current clientele um, in both of my businesses. That's most of the clientele when I was running a club for 11 years. Very, very, very wealthy people. Wonderful people. Mm -hmm. But same problems that anybody has. Yeah. It's not sad. like their, their wealth made them like bulletproof from problems. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've met so many that are, are still, they're still sad inside and it's, yeah. and it's almost like they, they feel like because they, they have like a higher social status because of their wealth mm-hmm. and things like that. They, they feel the need to hide it. Um, I think worse than probably regular people do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's it's just interesting. That's it's literally the majority of my career is in uh, that population, and it just taught me a lot of lessons. You know, it's like you know, this is not what I want. I don't need to live in a house that's ten thousand square feet, twenty thousand square feet. You know, I've been in those things. It's just it doesn't make sense to me. No. You know, two people living in that house. I get it. The whole financial aspect, try to flip the home, make money, but it doesn't feel comfy. Doesn't feel like a home to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just doesn't make sense, you know. And and again, I really think that more people are desiring just to enjoy their life. And if you have to kill yourself work-wise to have all those things, I think you've missed out on the point of being alive. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And you have, I mean, because of all of your degrees and things like that, would you, do you, do you actually have like a deeper understanding or, or understand or know, I guess, that like working like that can actually physically affect you? Yeah, I think it's it's really comes down to basic psychology. I was I was on another podcast talking about this and then a little bit recently on one of mine of uh, talking about cost and power. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's a really it's a basic psychological tenet, but it's really about decision making uh with that and and people if you understand the cost and the power of of a situation, you pretty much can predict the decision that a person will make. And so, you know, for being wealthy, and I've seen it a lot of times, the decision is I'm going to protect whatever I can to maintain this lifestyle, because if I don't, then it will, I will lose a lot of power, perceived power. Mm -hmm. And the identity that I have is wrapped up in that power. And so the cost is really high. So they're going to do whatever they can to maintain that identity. Um, 
but if somebody, you know, to look at it for a thing like wearing a mask or anything like that, mm-hmm. like for somebody who wears a regular, you know, and they don't really have a big issue with it, the cost is probably very low for them to wear a mask because they're like, well, what's the, what's the big deal? Right. You know, like how does this affect the power that I have in life and this and that? I think if you're really secure with yourself, most of your decisions are pretty low cost. You're like, well, I'll do that because the cost is not high to me mm-hmm. for that. Right. And people generally also make decisions based off of their level of agreeableness, conscientiousness, um, how open they are to experiences, how neurotic they may be, how extroverted they are. And so understanding those traits in people will help you understand how they move in life and the decisions they make. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So did you say that you actually have a partnership in one of your businesses? Yeah, I co-own one of my businesses with uh, a gentleman named uh, Alan Jakubowskis, who's probably my best friend. And um, he was my supervisor for almost 12 years in the previous company we're both in. Hmm. And we just developed this really good friendship over the years. He's a great mentor, taught me everything I know about the health and wellness, like luxury amenity business. And um, just how to, you know, move in and out of different big corporate meetings, caring about people, um, how to bake an idea really all the way through the idea concept to the actual execution of it. And it just felt like, right, when I was deciding to leave the company, you know, I wanted to do something different over time. And we just kind of came together and said, you know, why don't we do something together then? And, um, so I moved up here where he lives two years ago. And, uh, cause at one, I wanted a different lifestyle for my family than, uh, Las Vegas was a lot of fun for 15 years. Believe me, I had a great time, oh, I bet. <laughs> um, but it was, it was awesome. I was crushing life mm-hmm. in Las Vegas mm-hmm. on all levels, having good times, but I felt like it was time. My daughter was seven at the time and I wanted her to be in a more relaxed environment. Yeah. Uh, to grow up in. And so up here, it's just it's so beautiful and peaceful, small town living. So that's how that came about. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's, yeah, that's something I've been interested in lately, because even when I was going through business school, they talked about the different ways that you can make a company, you know, and technically speaking, a partnership is probably the most beneficial, but it's also one of the hardest things to actually come mm-hmm. to fruition because it's, you know, you have to work with someone else and and their likes and dislikes and, and come to, you know, conclusions and agreements with each other and then other people. And it's just, it's, <laughs> it's, we were told that. Yeah. Yeah. We were definitely told that, that like, you think it'll work out? Like, you know, you're working with another person. Mm-hmm. This guy was your boss for all, for over a decade. I said, yeah, it'd be fine because we um, had worked so long together Mm -hmm. and we had built a a business relationship first. And then maybe the last six years of us being in another company, we started developing a really strong friendship. And I would go up and just enjoy spending time with him. And, you know, we'd go and do a lot of fun things together, go into Canada up to Whistler and enjoy weekends up there for like guys weekends. And so, you know, our families got close. And I felt like we always were very open with each other about what we wanted, how we wanted to be friends. And when the idea for the business, we were just very clear in the expectations for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think, and also it's not like we entered into a business that we didn't really know anything about. It's not like we were like, I like food. I want to make a restaurant. Have you run a restaurant? No, I haven't done that before. Let's do something different. Like right. this was something we were already doing already. We just wanted to do our own version of it on a smaller boutique level. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you have, so you actually have the, the two businesses. So you have the partnership and then you have your own mm-hmm. online, correct? Because the partnership is yeah. the consulting. Yeah, consulting and management of uh, health and wellness amenities. And then my live virtual personal training business is just my thing. Right. Yeah, of course. And then your podcast, of course. So in my podcast, which is not a business no. clearly, but, but it's a, I'm working at it like it's a business. I tell you right? that. Right. Yeah. I can, you're clearly a hard worker. Of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do like the, the consulting business part-time and then your um, other business part-time? Uh, I would say it's probably, it's, it's different. It's really based off of kind of supply and demand, like the training business is just huge demand for mm-hmm. it. So I'm doing more of that in my time. 
the uh, consulting and management business is a lot less time for me currently just because most of your amenities are shut down or are partially opened. Mm -hmm. So we're not spending a lot of time on that business right now. And so for both of us, I think we are, we were very clear that while like we have this business together, there are other interests we also had. Like I would never stop training. It's just something I love doing. I enjoy the connection with other people. And uh, I've been, I've been training through all of my other biz, all of my other work life. So when I was running a club, I was still training a lot. When I became uh, the national director of that company, I was still training a lot. And mm-hmm. I was, when I would open clubs, I was still training a lot. So I knew that it would always be uh, compete for time with the other company that I have. So uh, again, we talked about that and he knows that I will continue to train and and certainly right now it's a bigger business just because of the the need is much much larger for that right of course yeah absolutely so i also noticed so i i talk a lot to a lot of people who are coaches on my podcast and they have mm-hmm. like a certified coaching thing but i also noticed that you're a certified personal trainer through the national strength and conditioning association how is that different from any other personal trainer yeah, training is a very highly unregulated industry. I mean, anybody can become a trainer like very quickly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I think so there's there's what I would say is like maybe a top 7 or 8 certifications. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's confusing. So like the consumer often though doesn't really care. They don't check, they don't know about it. But if you're in the business, you know, there's definitely a tiering or ranking of what is your more rigorous certifications. You know, I did the NSCA, uh, one, because I was working at a facility uh, at a career college that that was the curriculum. And I you know, so they wanted us all to become NSCA certified when I was starting the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at it, I said, this is a really good certification. And I had done that curriculum in college as well. It's very rigorous. I think, I don't know what the pass rate is currently, but um, when I was taking it, early 2000s, the pass rate was like, I think, 57%. It's pretty low. So um, it's a very rigorous science-based degree, whereas uh, I think the other ones are not as heavy in science. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually, um, they have different uh, measures of what they're wanting you to do and things of that nature. So I like the NSCA because I think, one, it was the first third-party certified personal training degree, I think back in 1993. So it really led the field and like, hey, we want this to be a legitimate profession. We want it to be a rigorous test. And it's not something you can just go over the weekend and take. I mean, you really have to know what you're talking about to take the test. You need to study for six months. A lot of these other certifications, you could literally just walk in there and be like, well, okay, I think I can get certified over this weekend. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's one of the things that I or that's one of the reasons I asked is because I know that there are so many people who, you know, just like coaches call themselves personal trainers, but there's so many different things that that can mean. (laughs) No, the problem, though, Kat, is that and I'm very aware of this, you know, my industry is kind of um, it's it's a legitimate industry, but in the sense of that it is so unregulated, there's too many too many people in the pot, too many certifications, and it's just too easy to get into. You know, when you have a low bar to get into anything, you're going to have a lot of duds. Yeah, in exactly. You know, mm-hmm. uh, honestly, podcasting is the same way. Oh, I know. It's a low bar to start a podcast. Anybody could start a podcast. That's why there's so many, but that's also why there's a lot of low quality ones too, mm-hmm. because as soon as you make something cost more or you make people jump through hoops, you eliminate the people who are just kind of doing it for fun yep, for exactly. that. Exactly. Yep. And that's that's our problem in personal training. We still have a lot of hobbyist people who are trainers who are like, I'm an insurance agent and I train people on the side, or I'm a real estate agent and I train people on the side. So that doesn't make the business extremely legitimate because you got people who are like dipping their toes in mm-hmm. and then they decide, well, this isn't profitable to me. I have to do too much traveling around and stuff. So they end up just going back into insurance or whatever. I'm just saying these are These are just examples of professions. They're not bad professions, by the way. They're very good professions, whatever you're doing. (laughs) I'm just saying, yeah, Mm -hmm. they're all necessary. I'm just saying like whatever your other hustle is, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times it's very difficult to find a trainer 
who was like in their fifties, still training. Right. Uh, cause it's a hard business to be in cause it's a sales business. No matter what anybody tells you, it's a sales business. You have to be good at sales. Mm. You have to have great charisma and you have to be good in terms of exercise progression and the science of it. Yeah. I was just talking to some people about that the other day where, you know, you can have a business and be the best at what you do, but if you're not good at sales, you can't get people in. And then you have people no. on the opposite side of the spectrum who are really good at sales and can get all the people in, but the program or whatever <laughs> it is that they're actually offering is really not that great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like, you're not going to find a lot of highly educated trainers. Like mm -hmm. people always ask me like, wow, you're a trainer and you have your doctorate. Do you need that? I'm like, no, but I knew that if I had it, it would be a huge differentiation for me mm -hmm. because it's rare to find a trainer that has as much education as I do. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause you don't even get a bachelor's degree. I mean, literally you could just, so I was like, man, I really want to know what I'm doing. I want to understand both the psychology and this and the the physiology of it. And I also didn't want to sugarcoat it with people. There's a lot of trainers, especially in the age of the internet, is there's a lot of fanaticism and you know, influencers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of your really good trainers are not on that stuff. They're not putting their stuff out on Front Street, you know, and taking all these pictures and doing poses in front of trains and stuff and flips and all that. Like a lot of your really good trainers, they're grinding in the dark. They're too busy to do any of that stuff. Right. They don't have time to be doing, you know, three hour photo shoot of selfies and stuff. That's none of my colleagues who are really getting after it, who are really knowledgeable, do any of that stuff. None of them. You know? Yep. That's how it goes. So can you <laughs> can you go into a little bit of the science behind training exactly? Because I mean, you talked about psychology a little bit and you've talked about the physiology of it, but you also mentioned that there's, mm -hmm. so can you kind of go into that? Because I have honestly zero idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. This is something I think is really important for the general public to know yeah. and obviously trainers, but a lot of exercise is really based off of some very basic concepts, which is the concept of providing a stimulus. And that stimulus over time, uh, applied gradually, creates a change in the body. But I think, but really to make it very understandable is you have to understand like the difference between exercise, physical activity, and movement. Those are three very different things. But society does not differentiate that. No. Like any commercial... Or somebody, or the lay person, they go, did you exercise today? Did you work out today? And um, those things don't mean the same thing. So exercise is really the process of providing a stimulus. Then there's some level of recovery to that. Then you apply another stimulus that's a little bit greater than the last stimulus. And your body continually gets stronger, more cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, muscular strength, increased mobility, range of motion, all these things with it. But the concept of exercise is a, a consistent, gradual stimulus over time. Physical activity is not that. Physical activity is you may have started with a stimulus that uh, was a little bit harder than you're used to, and then you don't provide a consistent stimulus. So essentially, this is what a lot of the public does is they start exercising, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to get myself in shape. And when you first start, let's say walking, right? You, it's hard the first time you do it, or you run on a treadmill, or you go in the gym and you, oh my gosh, I feel terrible. This is like terrible. Mm -hmm. And then you come back the next time, you're like, oh, this is a lot easier. And then it gets easier and easier. But what you stop doing is making the program more difficult. Mm -hmm. And you go, I'm going to just stay where I'm at mm -hmm. because this is comfortable for me. You are engaging in physical activity at that point, mm -hmm which is majority. And then movement, and people say, move. So all this movement. Movement essentially is unstructured activity. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I'm just generally walking around, getting up, um, walking to the post box or whatever, I, whatever. It's just, it's just very general movement of being a, a human being. There's no stimulus at all. And so there's no improvement really in any of the systems for that. Mm -hmm. So the science really is, for the lay person is, what am I actually engaging in? Is this exercise? Is this physical activity? Or am I just moving? What is that? And so if, I think if you know what your goal is, if your goal is just to move, then my, my assessment then is you're not trying to really create 
um, a tremendous amount of uh, stimulus in what you're doing. Right. They say, I want to, I want to improve though. I'm like, well, that's going to require you to move into a different category mm-hmm. uh, called exercise. And they're like, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing right. <laughs> for that. <laughs> so that's like, I would say your very basic understanding of that, not getting into understanding like changes in stroke volume, cardiac output, VO2 max. That's more of your technical stuff. You yeah. Know? That's more, more math than I think most people want to do. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to know about the, you know, your, the amount of oxygen you consume per milliliter per minute, you know, and all that stuff. Actually it's boring to me, honestly. It's uh, but it's, it's more of your laboratory stuff, in my opinion, you know, data. And I think that's the weird thing about like everybody is trying to track their numbers, their heartbeat, Mm -hmm. you know, their oxygen, oxygen saturation, all these things, the general public. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that information? Right. Like, one, do you know what it is? And two, what are you going to do about it? Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. My, uh, my watch tracks my heartbeat all the time and I can tell when it goes up and down. Um, but I don't know why it does that. <laughs> and you know, what's funny, there's tremendous research that is being developed and has been developed that is showing us or indicating to us that the body monitoring or tracking devices, mm-hmm. even though people have them, People are much better at tracking themselves, monitoring themselves subjectively, like, how do I feel? You know, how does this make me feel when I do it? Um, You know, do I feel happier? Do I feel like really exhausted versus uh, a tracking system telling them that? Yeah, absolutely. I have um, scoliosis in the lower part of my back. Mm -hmm. And so there are some exercises that I can 100% do and be totally fine. But there are other exercises where like my heart rate, my heart rate might rise because it's actually Mm. causing me pain to do it. But that doesn't mean anything now for like the exercise, (laughs) like my heart rate is no longer associated with the amount of exercise that I'm getting. (laughs) Because yeah, I don't think we teach people enough how to listen to their bodies. Mm, And and honestly, I was really fortunate for that. I'm not going to say like, oh man, yeah, because I, you know, I was in a fortunate situation that where as a track and field athlete, that's all you do. You listen to your body when you're running, doing intervals, you got a basic Casio watch that you use to time yourself and all Mm -hmm. that. And you listen to your respiration rate. Mm -hmm. You feel the cadence when you're running on the track or on the trail or up a hill. Mm. You can sense when you're moving faster, when you're slowing down. You really get a sense of being inside yourself and monitoring your systems for that. Mm -hmm. And and so for me, like I don't have like a certain amount of time I work out. I listen to how I'm feeling, like how much do I have left in the tank? I can accurately gauge how much I have left internally. Mm And that's when I'm stop. That's when I stop. I don't stop because a time told me to stop. Right. You know, type of thing. And so that's part of just listening to your body. And so I think sometimes we're we're trying to almost take that out of our natural human instincts. We're trying to almost eliminate that. And I'm not saying tracking things aren't useful. They can be very useful, mm-hmm. GPS and all that. But don't take away this natural GPS, this natural rhythm that you have to understand how you feel. Yeah. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. When I was in high school, um, I did volleyball and all those fun things. Mm -hmm. Um, But in order to do that, we had to, you know, exercise. We had like regular training and stuff like that. Well, um, we moved from Kansas to Missouri right before my freshman year in high school. And I tried to be on the volleyball team in Missouri and like run with them. And I almost passed out in the middle of yeah. the thing because we were doing it outside. We had moved from the part of Kansas that I'm from was very, very dry heat. Mm-hmm. And I'm used to the dry heat. I can survive in dry heat all day long, but we had moved sure. to Missouri where it's like extremely humid. And I had never been in an environment like that before. And then I went running and I was like, Ooh, I'm doing good. I did like two laps and I didn't even stop. And then we went to do sprints and I almost passed out. <laughs> Right. And I'm right, like, yeah. I don't think I can breathe. Right. I don't know what's going on. And like my side was hurting and I never understood why. And my coach was just like, walk it off. You'll be all right. And I'm like, but I'm going to pass out. So I don't think that's off. all right. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing, you know, coaches in sports, they're really not that knowledgeable about the human body. No. 
Um, maybe they are a little bit more now. We have sports scientists in many universities and different things, right. but the coach itself is generally not. Their their expertise is in maybe the X's and O's of the work of the you know the um, actual sport. Mm-hmm. But the it's funny that somebody that teaches a skill in a sport, let's say volleyball, and you're learning serving and digging and striking, mm-hmm. they may not have almost any knowledge of actually the physical activity aspect of right. it in the training element, which is cri- is critical component. Yeah. So like make uh, sure that, that you your know, players walk it off. That's not how you say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Walk it off. I was like, I'm going to walk it off to the office because I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just drop the mic, walk yeah. it off. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not trying to pass that every time I go to practice. I don't know what's going on. I've never done this before. So no. Yeah. yeah. So that didn't last very long. I think it's just a lot of, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just a lot of knowledge. Like the science part is just not communicated properly yeah. to the public. I mean, one, it can't be complicated. They're not explaining it like I just did with those three things. Right. But two, a lot of fitness information is being distributed through um, like influencers mm-hmm. and things of that nature. I mean, a lot of these folks have no actual fitness background yeah. and things of that nature uh, or education. Um and a lot of fitness today is a lot of distraction. It's a lot of entertainment. Um, it's really like, do something that is fun for you. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, you can do that. But I mean, if you want to improve, this concept of fun is strange to me. Mm-hmm. Um, because improvement like of your, like I'm talking about, if you really want to make a large improvement to your cardiovascular system, your muscular strength, endurance, and all that, there's a level of very being very uncomfortable to that. Yeah. You know, I like, I, for an example, like I used to hire Zumba instructors and stuff for this club I run, ran. And I remember telling the instructors, I'm like, that's great. I love to dance. It's good. How does the class get better? Right. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, how do you, how do you provide overload? And the, like the stimulus that continues to improve is like, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, is the, the is it the art? Does it like the beats per minute get faster? each time you do the song or is there a longer song whatever it is is there some variable that makes the dance harder mm-hmm. each time they're like no it's just the choreography you do the same choreography here and there blah blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And i'm like then there will be no improvement right. over time they're just going to come there and dance and be like that was fun and that's great if that's your goal but if you're like i want to actually get better like keep improving my stamina uh, muscular endurance whatever there has to be some level of it being a new stimulus introduced. And often when you introduce a new stimulus, it is not fun. Right. You know, so, <laughs> exactly. so this entertainment aspect is, is, is a veil. It doesn't tell people the truth behind it's uncomfortable. It's okay if it doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. You know? And it sucks sometimes. <laughs> Of course it does. Were you good at your job the first day you did it? It probably wasn't that fun. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, right. You yeah, know, that it's just this life, but we, we want to have comfort all the time. Make it comfortable for me. Make exercise easy. easy. Mm-hmm. How about we make it fun? Go rollerblading. Fine. Go do that. But how do you get better at it? Right. How are you going to improve that rollerblading? You need to go faster. You need to go farther. You know, like there's, there's variables that need to change to improve. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's so that part of it is so interesting to me. Like the comfort level of people is what's interesting to me because they want, and I completely understand. And I even understand like why, you know, the industry makes it look like it's fun and easy and entertaining or whatever. Um, But it's also like, it's, it's so like a degeneration of human beings is almost what it feels like because like, way, way, way back in the day, we just used to wake up and go have physical activity literally all day long and never stop Mm -hmm. until we went to sleep. And we, we knew it was time to go to sleep because it was just dark and we couldn't do anything else anyway. And we were probably tired by the end of the day. And now we've gotten to such a point, which this, this, I mean, coronavirus aside, even, I think it's such an interesting time because we, we just, we have something on a screen to to entertain us literally 24/7 and even if you're at work mm-hmm. your your screen is what is helping you quote unquote be more productive but 
you know, no one is, is focusing on, on physical activity or exercise or how your body actually feels or anything outside of the screen, I feel like. <laughs> and it's a little disheartening. Um, but I mean, I guess it's a great social experiment. <laughs> well, we're, you know, what's interesting when this, the pandemic was coming on mm. and, um, you know, this was like at the beginning. I said, wow, man, this is crazy. And then um, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, there's another pandemic that's, I think, been happening, but because it goes so slow yeah. and it's not life-threatening very quickly, mm -hmm. um, that we're not spending time uh, attesting to that, which is like obesity or diabetes, high blood pressure, right. you know, and people throw that stuff around. But the, but the honest truth is like within 20 years, like close to 60% of our population is going to be obese. Yep. That's crazy. That's crazy. That, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will, but it's often the slow encroaching things that you don't see mm -hmm. is what end up becoming the huge bombs mm -hmm. over time. And this one's going to detonate in a, not in a, a while for now, but it's growing and growing. And um, it's really concerning, you know, because I, I work with so many people and training them and stuff like that. And, you know, it's staggering the lack of knowledge people have about their own body mm -hmm. and how to, mo how to move it, how to create more mobility and stability. And, you know, often what happens for me is I get people who are like, now they're going into these really high intensity exercise classes. Mm. So they go on their day one, they're doing bur burpees, box jumps. Um, they're doing these high impact activities. And I get them, I say, listen, we're not doing any of that starting out. We're going to build your base. We're going to work on increasing your range of motion, increasing your mobility, stability in different joints. And then we're going to add on more complex activities, more stimulus so that you're ready to do more complex things. We do it backwards. We try to add complexity first to the pop lay population and then they get hurt. Mm -hmm. And then people don't like exercises. Oh, this is too hard. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. It's just because they don't know what they're doing. That's right. why, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I know plenty of obese people who definitely, they already have a, a low range of movement, you know, like you mentioned, and they definitely need to do more physical activity first before they get to the exercise part of it. <laughs> Yeah, just moving, you know, initially and then building up from movement to maybe physical activity, then into exercise. But I mean, especially with obesity, it's such a, a nutritional based thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I was told so many people try to, like, if they try hire a trainer, it's like, I want to lose weight. And I always say, uh, exercise is probably one of the worst ways to lose weight. It's not efficient. Yeah. It's not, that's not its purpose, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Um, you're going to get much better results if you actually have a different dietary approach or nutritional approach in terms of weight loss. But exercise is a good contribution to it, right. just like sleep is as well. And having less stress in your life. I often tell people like, you want to you wanna lose weight. One of the best ways is to see who is in your life. How, who's stressing you out in your life constantly that um, you know, may be causing you to have increased cortisol levels and all those things related to it. So actually, the stress from human to human is a huge cause of weight gain for people. Really? You know? So a huge amount of it no is idea. related to that. So, yeah. So it's, a, it's not just like, it's, oh, I'm going to exercise to lose weight. I always say, listen, are you willing to take, uh, you know, take an uh, evaluative look at the stress levels in your life? Are you really willing to commit to sleeping better, you know, providing some interventions to sleep well? Are you willing to have a better approach to your nutrition? And are you willing to be consistent with actual exercise? If you're willing to do those four things, you're going to see staggering results. But if you just want to exercise your way to being smaller, good, that's you, you're not, you're not ready for the amount of exercise that you would need for that to contribute primarily it would be staggering, staggering Wow. for that. Yeah. So it's really a multifactorial mm -hmm. And it's it actually being fit causes you to assess your life in all areas. It, to truly be fitter and to feel better is a full life evaluation if you really want to do it. Oh, yeah, totally. I've heard that from other personal trainers and people, nutritionists and things like that. They're like, it's a 
you know, they, they call it a lifestyle change, but it's not, it's a, it's a whole life change. I think a whole life change. It's a whole, like I see trainers sometimes are like workout maniacs and then they, Oh, I sleep three hours a night. I'm like, you're just wasting your time (laughs) at this point. You know, I'm like, you're just beating up your results. Right. You're sleeping three hours a night. You know, it's like, you know, you've got to do it. You know, you need to make the effort, you know, to um, not have some weird obsessive nutritional habit, you know, that is very restrictive. You need to have a good moderate approach. You need to really focus on having good sleep opportunity, good quality sleep time. What are the things you're doing to cause that to happen for that? You know, and then I'm really a big proponent of the stress in your life. If you can have as least amount of stress as possible in your life, it's going to contribute to obviously a much happier life, but it's going to contribute to weight loss, sense of well-being, uh, and that whole deal. And that is something that when I ask people, I'm like, well, who's who's for you in your life? You know, who who causes a lot of stress in your life? They're like, why do you want to know that? I'm like, because it's a large part of why you're going to succeed or not. Yeah. You know, that's crazy to even think about. I had, I genuinely had no idea that that would affect your, you know, your weight or your, your choices about, you know, how you move and things like that. But mm-hmm. that's super interesting. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're like, thank you for the knowledge. Uh-huh. About yes, definitely. That's definitely something I needed to know. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think if intuitively, again, listening to your body, you kind of know. It's kind of like if somebody, I work out every single day, seven days a week. I'm controlling what I eat, blah, 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 this and that. I'm like, how's your personal life? Oh, it's a mess. I'm like, there you go. <laughs> That's probably your problem right there. And they're like, what? That has nothing to do with it. It's like, it has everything. Right to do with it. You're releasing all these stress-based chemicals in your body. It's um, You're washing your whole system with a mess of hormones and, and all these things. I'm like, I'm telling you, lower your stress in your life. Watch what happens. It never ceases to amaze me how often our brain or our feelings affect the whole rest of our life. <laughs> yeah. So many times a day. Well, thank you so much. I know that you are going to have to run. So I want to let you go now. Um, And just this has been a, I can't tell you how helpful this has been. Um, But I know it's going to be helpful for, you know, many, many more as well. So thank you so much for coming on. Do you have um, any other teachable moments or anything specifically that you would like to share? Yeah, I think, you know, I think every day, it's good to just evaluate where you are um, today. And then in, in evaluating that, think about the biggest teachable moments for me is the teachable moments I can have with other people. How can I help someone else become more successful than me? And if I can do that and, and I could help somebody become successful, whatever their definition of that is, mm-hmm. make them feel good, um, and just be... Um, a stable, supportive, a responsible person in their life. You've done most, more than most people have done for another human in their entire life if you've done that. Done that. So um, that's, I think, learning that for me over time has been a huge uh, deal. Yeah, that is absolutely true. How did you learn that lesson? I think just through time, like um, working on myself. Mm-hmm. Like in, you know, I had a uh, great therapy when I was in college. It was actually part of my uh, curriculum, my training in college that we had to have a, a therapist to really. So uh, having that at like 19 through 20 was like amazing, you know, to really like learn about myself, taking public speaking. And then I did just think being curious, just like you do with your show, meeting all these different people, you start learning how important it is to invest in the other people mm-hmm. and their well-being. Because all of a sudden you start seeing the world in a different way when you talk to a lot of different people. And that's what I think for a lot of people, stop living in your cocoon. Don't be in uh, this homogenous culture that you may be in, this mono uh, culture or where everybody looks like you and everybody sounds like you or you know, you're just kind of whatever, like expose yourself to different things regularly, different cultures, different ideas, um, obviously different people. And you will come away like blown away by humanity Mm -hmm. with that. 
And so I, I think for me, it's really the more podcasts I do, the more people I train and everything, I become a better human because of them. Right. That's awesome. Yep. That is a great teachable thing to share. Well, thank you so much thank again. You. Do you have a website or anything? I encourage everyone again to listen to your podcast, which is Dr. D's Social Network. And do you have a, um, a, well, you said that you don't have a website for that, but you should have one probably for your personal training or in any other way anybody wants to get a hold of you? Yeah, for my spa, um, fitness and recreation consulting and management business, it's ELM adventures.com. So like Elm, the Elm tree, Elm adventures.com, mm. um, which just is a very simple website, just about what we do, who we are, our philosophy. And my, my personal training aspect, I don't have a website for that either because it's over time, it's become just a referral based business at this point. So I keep it kind of a very exclusive thing and, uh, people find me through other people okay. for that. So, um, but I'm on LinkedIn all the time, so people can easily find me on there. Um, but, you know, find out from me, find out about me primarily through my podcast because you're, you're just going to hear me talking. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly. You have been listening to the Teachable Soul podcast. You can find us on any social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as the Teachable Soul or on Twitter as Teachable Soul. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Teachable Soul. You can also visit our website for more information at theteachablesoul.com. 